Now, yesterday there was um, a range of discussion that was very enjoyable and a lot of endorsement of evidence-based policy from yesterday's panel. I thought it was fascinating. So part of my role here is actually to provide some of the evidence that's available. And I'm roughly going to do it in three parts. Uh, part one was, was, what's the kind of evidence that existed before the pandemic really took hold? So what, what did the profession know? What was it? So it's a bit of a literature review, of what we could use to help inform decisions. What is the kind of evidence that we could uh, accumulate through the pandemic? And then I'll have a look at what the future might hold uh, using a, a simple framework, a simple model. So that's the plan. Um, there's a lot of charts, so let, let me sort of step through them. Uh, and the first bit of evidence is looking back a long, a long history of pandemics. And before the current one, we've got a list here of the 12 largest pandemics. Um, and, and unfortunately, the current one is now listed as close to it's number three on the list in terms of deaths. So it's quite a bad one. Uh, you know, fortunately, a long way off uh, what the outcomes in terms of the Spanish flu or even the Black Death. Uh, I, but I want to talk about the evidence that comes from all those pandemics in, in a little while. Um, um, but what, one, of the, one of the big pieces of evidence that we had from economic history uh, was through the Spanish flu. And interestingly, um, there, there was this study of what happened in US cities. So that, um, and there were some cities who would have non-pharmaceutical interventions, a nice big word, economists use, really that meant lockdown. Um, and there was others who did not have the lockdowns. And then we asked, what was the, uh, the, the study asked, what was the employment and mortality outcomes? There's a little chart. And you can see the red dots, which, um, so the red dots had the city um, without the interventions and the green dots um, with the interventions uh, separate out. And the evidence points to clearly um, that interventions can have a better public policy outcome in terms of reducing deaths. And actually the economic outcomes are probably no worse and might have been even better after the pandemic was over. So again, just having knowledge of what the economic history was, being able to access the results, um, is a useful bit of data that we can say, confronting this, even if we don't have time to study the current event, we can look back at what was on the shelf, and how can it help us make decisions in real time about what's the general ability to, uh, and efficiency of the, the kind of remedies that we might be looking at. Very quickly through the pandemic, um, economists got on to can they blend uh, some of the studies that look at epidemics and into economics? And Eichenbaum and Friends, uh, very early in the piece, uh, put together an economic model and an epidemic model. Interestingly, they're both a set of difference equations, so they, they can join them quite easily. Uh, and they, found, and they started looking at trade-offs. And again, the public policy outcomes in terms of uh, protecting people um, was very strong. They did find something of a trade-off. But again, the real insight was the trade-off really wasn't between saving the economy and saving people. The trade-offs were between the cost, it's what you have to invest now, and the potential benefits in the future. So the decisions become trade-offs across time not across the economy and debts. Uh, so that was a, a very interesting uh, paper that uh, should have been looked at. Um, some of the consequences then that we get uh, looked at very early on. Looking back, so Alan Taylor and friends, again, good economic historian, looked at the past 12 pandemics, so a very long span of history. And he said, you know, what are the long-term consequences? What are we going to be confronted with? Uh, well, typically, um, these kind of disruptions alter economic behavior, and they have a long tail of impact. And they found that interest rates are 2% lower than they would otherwise have been some 20 years after the event. So it just changed the economic structure sufficiently for these long-lasting effects 
I'll come back to that to current research about the type of impacts we might need to be thinking about. Um, so that was a very quick scan of sort of, of two or three big papers that we knew in advance, uh, sorry, of, of, yeah, in advance of the event that we should be able to draw on what was on the shelf and how can that inform decision makers live. The next thing, uh, as, we were, as the infection was breaking out globally, uh, everybody started becoming an amateur epidemiologist and looking at the standard models. Uh, and it has a couple of lessons that are worthwhile. So on the chart on the left shows the typical wave that happens. It's a very nonlinear process. You get this explosion of cases uh, as it runs through the population and it eventually dies down. So these standard models of those being susceptible, exposed, infected, and then ultimately recover. So you get these wave effects. And um, that's all very well, but you need, you need a way to inform yourself in real time. You need to bring that information into a, a sufficient statistic. And, and the one that we all learned about was the reproduction rate. And that's the chart on the right. And for most, most epidemic models, that's a constant number. So if you put how, how a disease would spread through a petri dish, it's a constant number. But of course, humans react, they, they change their behavior. And this reproduction rate, depends on two things. It depends on the probability that a susceptible person meets an infected person. And the second thing it, it depends on is once the meeting takes place, the probability of actual transmission. So there's two things that have to happen. You have to meet and it has to be passed on in the meeting. And with those two bits of information, you need to break the chain by two types of different intervention, either stop the meeting, that's a lockdown, or if you do meet, lower the probability that you pass on the, the, the disease and that might be safe through using masks. Um, and so when you get these interventions, you don't get a constant reproduction rate, you can get a reproduction rate that moves through time. And this, the chart on the right shows uh, sort of a typical pattern across many countries. So it started very high, very high, very high relative to what the constant disease number would look like. And largely, largely that was just people seeding it as they're coming off planes. So the reproduction rate looks very high. As you get the intervention, it comes down. And what you want to see, uh, you want the interventions to be sufficient to bring the reproduction rate below this magic number of one. That means as a person's passing on the disease, once it, if the number's two, each person passes it on to two other people, the disease continues to explode. Once it goes below one, on each person that has it passes it on to less than one person on average, the disease will die out. And the difference here is if you get the number close to one, you'll bend the curve. You'll make things a little better, you'll help the hospitals, you'll bend the curve, but you won't stop the wave. If you get the reproduction rate below one, you can eliminate, you can actually go for elimination strategy. And that was an interesting choice New Zealand had, and it could be informed on the kind of decision. Now the scenario I've got here shows, well, never gets quite below one, and then actually people get sick of the lockdown and they, they alter their behavior in a way that it explodes again. And we saw that in some countries. Let's just have a look at a few um, empirical examples. So that's a theory. Uh, we saw for New Zealand uh, about this time last year, the cases were exploding, they plateaued and eventually came down. And that, uh, that was the experience. And again, mapping in real time, the reproduction rate, uh, and we could estimate this going through time and there's some error bands. But there was at some point um, towards the end of March, where that reproduction rate actually got below one. And that was a clear sign New Zealand was able to achieve elimination of this disease. You could, you could actually monitor it in, in real time. And, that was a, and that's what you would be looking for when you're looking at data. Uh, can you push this re, real time reproduction number below one? Uh, similar to New Zealand, Australia uh, had um, a very positive experience. They, they seeded the numbers very high from international travel. They brought it down very fast and, and actually probably a little bit faster than New Zealand. Their actual data, there's a little funny spike in the data. I think that was one of the cruise ships um, that spiked the numbers, but otherwise um, they managed an, an eliminated strategy just as effective as New Zealand. You can compare that to other countries. So the New Zealand, so the UK's experience was unfortunately one where they brought the reproduction number down ever really pushed it below one. So again, we see the outcome of that. It stayed in the community and then allowed these, these second and third waves to come through. 
is always present in, in the community cases. So they bent the curve, but they never really eliminated it. And again, similar story for the US. And then the reproduction number down to one isn't sufficient uh, and probably not, um, not the right outcome. So that was, that was um, monitoring the evidence in real time. And you can actually think about how would you forecast this and how would you test as you're going through that your interventions are actually working. So, that, so taking these models and taking a time series approach, you can project a few days forward what the model will suggest. Um, and here you go, uh, early on, um, this was a forecast that was made a few days, uh, a few days out and without intervention. So the forecast would be without intervention, what would happen? Well, again, you'd get that typical, um, typical epidemic model outcome where it would just explode, number of cases would actually increase. Um, but then if you monitor the actual outcomes after the interventions are taking place, the gap between these two curves gives you a metric of effectiveness of intervention. And again, so as the, the wider that gap, uh, the more you can be sure by looking at the evidence that you have in front of you, that things that your policy intervention is actually effective. Um, so that was one of the one of the things I was looking at um, about this time last year. And again, these are all in real time that you can actually look at these things. Uh, going through um, another bit of time series evidence that one can look at and monitor. Uh, it's fascinating. You can take daily information from people's mobility. So everybody uses an iPhone these days or so, some other type of, of phone. Um, uh, and where the people are going and what they're doing uh, is recorded. Uh, that data sits there, it's available. Big Brother is actually watching you. You can take that data and you can look at how mobility changes and its impact on both the economy and its impact on the reproduction rate. And that reproduction rate number will tell you whether you're being effective. And so a quick estimate here. So this is uh, the dynamic response of mobility on economic activity. I forget the scale for the moment. Um, so this is just what would happen with a one standard deviation. Of course, actual reality was about six standard deviations. So the movements are bigger. But, uh, and this is an estimate from around 20 countries. So this is the average response from around 20 countries. And unsurprisingly, as you lock the economy down, you shrink the economy rapidly. Um, uh, but then it seems to, and, and it shrinks in the first couple of months, lockdowns tend to last you know, six weeks or so on um, in the early stages. And the model suggesting for many countries, you would bounce back to somewhere where you were previously, maybe a little bit higher. And again, the effectiveness on mobility. Um, so the, and what does mobility do to the reproduction rate, the measured reproduction rate? Again, uh, the lockdowns clearly had this impact of reducing the, the susceptibility of the disease. Again, effectively stopping meetings taking place and stopping the spread. Again, you can, you can actually measure the impact of intervention by looking at what people are doing, their movement, are they obeying the, the intervention, how effective is, is the mobility, and what does it do to your economy, and what does it do to mobility. So again, you can, in real time, start to monitor and use evidence to track whether what you're doing is working on, on what is happening. Um, so with, with that said, um, we can... We can we had a stock of information at the start. We, we could in real time start looking at data and, and, and measuring. Um, but we, part of the brief here was also what might the future hold? How might this now ravel from this point onwards? So I took a, um, been doing some work uh, with a long time colleague, a long time collaborator, Professor Viv Hall. And we had a, a we, we used this model we just recently published to look at another big shock, which is the global financial crisis. And we said, well, can we recirculate this framework to have a look at the current shock? And, and to some extent, yes, and to some extent, no. Um, but again, it's what can we take off the shelf and use quickly? And this framework um, is very specifically look, focused on New Zealand. And it, and it has five essential elements. I'll quickly run through them. Um, again. The model is going to focus on what the household sector is going to be doing in terms of its spending behavior, its, its labor supply, 
it's going to look at firms and the pricing decisions and the labor demand. So important things in the current pandemic. But also going to have a central bank. We're going to think about you know how, how does the central bank help uh, repair some of the damage. It's also got a foreign sector, particularly in terms of financial markets, and we have an impact. And also a foreign sector in terms of foreign goods and. And for New Zealand being an open economy, these are important channels for the transmission of shocks through our economy. And we're going to allow um, prices to, to pass through incompletely. So again, when people sell cars in New Zealand, try and think about what New Zealand's incomes are and keep the prices relatively constant rather than move them out uh, constantly all the time. So we get this stickiness in imported prices. So that's the model we're going to use. It seems reasonable uh, to think about how we can map the future with that. Um, and it will give you some typical things. So I'll, I'll just go through two typical policy responses that you might expect the model to do. And, and then we'll ask about these long-term consequences. So the first thing is, um, um, when you see the shock, um, people, people couldn't decide whether it was a supply shock or a demand shock. It's probably a combination of both. Uh, the lockdown disrupts productive activity. The economy runs into a recession. Uh, monetary policy sees that and says, well, look, um, we need to help. Uh, offset that. So the monetary policy easing will push output above what would have, would have otherwise taken place. And of course, it will also push inflation higher than what otherwise would have taken place without any monetary policy intervention. Um, and it will have the typical impact on exchange rates, actually, on, on impact. It will cause a depreciation or ultimately. Um, they will move back to either baseline or, or actually could be more appreciated in the long run. Um, so the, that was the typical response the model will do, very short-term fluctuations. Um, and I've, the, the little, the model was looking at the difference between post, pre and post GFC, the kind of differences. Uh, to be honest here, there's not that much difference. So we can probably take the baseline model and reflect the current shock and say, we'll have some similar impact. The other big response that we saw, incredibly speedy fiscal policy response, uh, rather unusual, it's often difficult to mobilize fiscal policy in real time, but we certainly did that and many countries did that as well. And again, you expect uh, an improvement in output, you expect to, to shift inflation higher than it would otherwise take, have taken place. But of course, as the government's um, having to finance all that fiscal expenditure and the use of real resources, uh, interest rates uh, would have expected to be higher than they would otherwise be, offsetting some of the lower interest rates that we would see from, from monetary policy. But the challenge we were confronted with, so that's the standard stuff, the challenge we were confronted with is in a backdrop where we know from economic history, this has a long tail event. But what we were looking at is the, is the disruption between investment and savings over many periods. And in some sense, we started the environment um, with that taking place. So there was, from the governor's speech earlier today, there was an important chart that, it, that showed the secular decline in interest rates. It's been going on for many, many years. Uh, there are a few forces that matter for this. One of them is what's referred to as the demographic dividend. It's the fact that many countries are now having fewer children in the emerging part of the world. Uh, basic economic tells us that as more people are of working age uh, relative to dependent age, so there's less kids in each family, um, more people working, the life cycle model will tell you more people will be saving. And that will deliver more savings into the global economy, something that Ben Bernanke referred to as the global savings glut. And there'll be more savings relative to planned investment. That's meant a secular decline in interest rates. That force is still taking place. So I'm roughly at about 12 basis points per quarter in New Zealand is my estimate. And the COVID-19, if we look at the last 12 pandemics over a long history, will only add to that force. So we're talking about a long-term secular adjustment to neutral interest rates. And that was something we looked at in the global financial crisis in this framework. And what would be the impacts for, our, for both output inflation and interest rates when that process takes place. Well, actually, what, what the model was projecting and what we would be expecting to see from these projections is the output, would we, whatever recession we would get, 
would recover reasonably quickly we get to baseline. So the, the economy would be pushed from its recession uh, back to potential, uh, potential in about three or four quarters. And the current one was obviously a lot faster than that. The process for inflation, uh, given that it's hard to read the mismatch between where real interest rates actually are and what the underlying interest rate that needs to be, given the forces in play, uh, hard to read, we probably had this decade long impact of inflation just coming below target. That's what we were confronted with over the last decade. Um, the current environment has the potential to repeat, but I'll, there's some exceptions. And of course, naturally in that environment, we get interest rates that stay very low for an extended period of time. Uh, and that's what we would expect from the current model and from economic history. A uh, couple of little uh, additional points from evidence uh, from the international scene. And what does that mean in terms of that framework? Now, I've got a couple of charts here. The first chart on the left would be something that would be normally, I would suggest to students, not what you would do. It's, it's, a, it's a hopeless way to represent information because there's so much white space. Although in, in this case, this is the, chi the Chinese um, business cycle. It's a reference series produced by the OECD. Um, but in this case, it shows you the, the massive impact of a lockdown on the Chinese economy. It's just so phenomenal. And then, of course, the rebound once you open up. So it's a temporary effect, but it's incredibly large. The other interesting piece of information that's hiding in this is the fact that the Chinese cycle has now bounced above the 100 point equilibrium reference point. So the, the Chinese economy business cycle is now above normal. It's above 100. Uh, and we're seeing that probably also across another, another, a number of Asian economies who were first into the COVID event so for start, so sort of fivefold effect. That impact is now starting to be seen in a range of commodity prices. I've got here grain crude prices, which have bounced from these incredible lows, but you can see it in copper prices and a whole range of other copper prices, which will start to feed into higher consumer prices eventually. Our financial markets have seen that, and there's an interesting, interesting gamble that's taking place. So this is the last slide, and then I'll, I'll leave it for questions. Uh, I've got. On the, on the left here, we've got these are bright five year break even uh, points for expect. This is what financial markets expect inflation to be five years from now. And they've gone from these incredibly lows, and the market has completely sold off to a point where we've now got the market ex expecting inflation, higher inflation than it has for many, many years. Almost as if the market expects the world to be shocked out of its disinflationary slumber. It's gonna shift things. That's what the, and an incredible sensitivity. This is what they expect five years from now after these events, after seeing movements in oil prices and so on. Uh, the US consumer, maybe, maybe not so convinced. And certainly uh, if you're listening to the communication from important institutions like the International Monetary Fund or the Fed or even our own reserve bank here, uh, they're looking at the, large output gaps, the scarring of the economy, the impact on the labor markets, to say, no, no, uh, inflation expectations are so anchored, the inflation risk is minimal. So we've got this interesting price surge that's coming from commodity prices. We will see prices increase. The real question is, will that be persistent or temporary? So quite a lot of information. Uh, I'm happy to let you think and absorb about that as we share questions. Come back to the mainstream. Well, thank you uh, very much, John, for that uh, hugely informative presentation. It really was a whirlwind tour of epidemiology, uh, history, um, and tying all of that in with macro policy. Uh, I'm afraid that given um, some poor time management our end, we're actually out of um, time for questions, so we'll have to ask people to direct their questions directly to you, so my apologies for that, John, but we are uh, most appreciative and grateful for those um, uh, that whirlwind tour that you've given us of so many complex and interacting um, uh, facets of, of the situation. Thank you very much, John, for your contributions. <laughs>